Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the BIPCOT No Government License. The BIPCOT NoGov license allows user modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango.org. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on TheSeedsOfLiberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. So today we have Lisa Delasho coming in from Maryland. She's a volunteerist, a homeschooler of a 15-year-old son, uh, and she's a nutritionist and a Freedom Fiends co-host since December 2015. Um, her Facebook pages are Nutritional Anarchy and Jake's Health Solutions. She uh, writes about nutrition mainly. Um, and her website, you can find her writing nutritionalanarchy.com so we're going to discuss um you know how her path to volunteerism and uh you know her style of homeschooling as well as um you know how nutrition you know study nutrition has affected her her evolution as an anarchist so uh lisa thanks a lot for coming on the show thanks for inviting me <laughs> yeah yeah I, uh, i've seen you around facebook a lot and uh <laughs> you know with the freedom fiends you know you're always on there and i hear you uh you know i, I listen to a few shows not all of them but um but it's a it's it's a delight. You know, we've had on Lou Fien on our show and the Seeds of Liberty, and uh, when Ben Ben Stone, I think, and you know, a couple oh, of, wow. a couple <laughs> of the fiends. We we haven't on have Bill Buprit yet, not yet. Um, you know, we're really trying to get him on. I had the uh, the fortunate uh, pleasure to interview him myself for my show. You know, guy's guy's amazing guy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> amazing, neat, <laughs> amazing intelligent guy. But um, but yeah. So before we get into that, um. Uh, please go into your your evolution of uh, volunteerism. How you came to this philosophy? Um, you know what books, podcasts, or or personalities have affected you? Sure. Yeah, it's kind of neat. Um, I when I first was able to vote, I won't say what year that was because it was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> it was pre-internet. I'll just say that uh -huh. um, I considered myself independent because I couldn't really relate to Republicans or Democrats. I found that I agreed with you know Republicans on some things and Democrats on others, and I never felt like I fit into either of those you know paradigms. And uh, so I just said, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to be independent. And then around 2002, I had neighbors who were really, really into politics. And we were talking outside one day and Jeff said, you know, what is your political affiliation? And I said, I just think that the government should leave everybody alone as long as they're not hurting anybody. I think people should be able to do what they want with their lives. And he said, oh, so you're a libertarian. And I said, okay, sure, I'm a libertarian. <laughs> Didn't really know what that meant. So I went and I started learning about that. And I thought, yeah, this makes sense to me. This is a fit. Libertarianism makes more sense than anything else. And, um, and that's big L libertarian. So in 2004, I voted for Michael Badnerick in the presidential election. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I started thinking, you know, does voting work at all? Is this ethical? I don't know. You know, I was really torn about it. And, you know, people kept telling me I was wasting my vote by voting libertarian. So I got lectured about that a lot, too. And then around 2012, uh, I was posting a lot about Gary Johnson on Facebook. And people were, were again telling me, you're wasting your vote. And I said, but this guy makes more sense than anybody else. You know, he wants us to be free and be able to run our own lives and have less taxation and all these great things. And people said, well, you know, you're just throwing your vote away. And I said, well, I need to vote on principle. You know, I need to vote for who I think is, is best for everyone. And the election got closer and closer. And at this point, I didn't have any friends who were anarchists. I had very few who were libertarian. Um, didn't even know what volunteerism was at that time. And I had one friend who is kind of libertarian. And he had a friend who kept posting stuff about taxation is theft and I kept seeing his posts come up on our mutual friends, you know, conversations. And I thought, taxation is theft. That's crazy. What do you mean? Like, we have to pay taxes. That's how, how society runs. And then I just kept reading this guy's posts. And I thought, this guy makes sense. You know, this, <laughs> at first, it was crazy to me. And then I thought, this guy makes sense. I, I get this. 
And I was talking, and then he added me as a friend. He sent me a friend request, so I added him. And then I saw him and his friends talking about Gary Johnson and how like voting was unethical and all these things. And I just, I started really paying attention. And then I gradually started following pages that he was posting from and then adding his friends. And then it just grew from there. And now I have this great network of you know, thousands of people that think like this, which is is really comforting because I don't feel so crazy anymore <laughs> or alone. But that's kind of how it happened for me. Probably around 2012 was when I said anarchy makes the most sense to me. Voluntarism. Like, everything should be voluntary. Yeah, like uh, it sounds so self-evident when you say it like that. Everything should be voluntary. We shouldn't be forced to do anything you know, against our will. Like, of course. What, 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 what other way is there to do things? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I've always been a peaceful person. I've always been against the death penalty, always. Um, always against the war on drugs, you know, anti-war, all of that. Mm -hmm. And so this, it just came full circle when I started meeting all these people online. I thought, great. <laughs> and, and when you say... Um, you know, they thought that you, you you threw away your vote. Like, to me, when somebody says that, I think of, um, you know, voting the lesser of two evils because, you know, if you're voting according to your principles, I mean, I mean, I don't vote at all, but if you're going to vote <laughs> and you're going to vote according to your principles, you know, that's the best vote that you can possibly do. You know, you're not throwing away your vote. That's what you really believe, right? That's your principles. Right. Um, so, so yeah. So when they say throwing your vote away, they're like, it's not going to do anything. So therefore, you have to vote, where, you know, more likely whoever you think is going to win, which which would be the lesser of two evil argument, which is, uh, is again, you know, it's, it's um, assuming that evil is necessary, uh, you know, a necessary evil, which is basically a contradiction, right? Because if something is evil then it's unnecessary and if it's necessary it can't be evil right <laughs> i totally agree yeah yeah around 2012 that's when it, that kind of sunk in for me i thought wait a minute no because i did kind of view libertarian candidates that way you know like th i still saw flaws but i thought the lesser of the three evils <laughs> i right, guess you could yeah. say and then you know like i said a few years ago i thought oh, wait a minute no what am i this is, I don't want to vote at all. I don't want to be a part of this system. I don't want to contribute to this. I don't want to validate it by voting for these people. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a very important point is, um, is that we give it legitimacy and validation by our participation, right? It only exists because people pay attention to it, right? And, and to me, that is the origin of power. Like when I tell people that, um, you know, talk about anarchy and voluntarism, and they're like, um, no, you're just crazy. Like, there's going to be, you know, there's always going to be people who want to control and manipulate others. And, uh, and and so you're just, you know, loony, you know, you're, you're utopian. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, of course, we never assume that people will be angels. But what we're trying to do, I mean, what I'm trying to do anyway, is help people to understand that the origin of power is always the people believing they have power, right? That's where power originates. Like, like you know, like it's helpful to understand that Hitler wasn't really a unique guy, right? And the only thing that differentiated him was that he had thousands of minions carry out his will, right? Really, he's now different than, I don't know, an everyday so psychopath or sociopath. But right. the difference is that guy doesn't have thousands of people carrying out his will, <laughs> That's right. Yeah, that's exactly how I see it now too. Like, if you guys would stop participating, then you know you wouldn't be giving your consent, and then maybe things would actually change. So. Yeah, yeah, it's like the uh, you know that that, that uh, the meme with um, you know the the politician standing on, on the plank right over the cliff, and all the people are holding him up. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right? that's a good one. All, all you yeah. have to do is walk away. Or or another way I heard Stefan Molyneux put it is um, you know it, it, it's like you know the, the state is like um, everybody blowing hot air on a balloon up in the air, right? And uh, and the only way to, you know, all we have to do is stop blowing, <laughs> you know, just like no other necessary, no other, no other uh, work is necessary. Um, so so what I'm trying to do, and I assume what you're trying to do is to educate as many people as possible that, um, no, you don't need rulers. You don't need people regulating you and controlling you in every detail and every aspect of your life. Um and life will go on as usual, basically. <laughs> That's what I tell people, yeah. And, and then, and of course, people give you the the response. Well, people are evil, right. and I say, and the most evil ones are usually the ones that want to be in charge of everyone else. 
so long. <laughs> yeah, make yeah. sense, does it? <laughs> yeah, like uh, the, you know, the, the types of people that are attracted to positions of power are not the most virtuous <laughs> people. Right. Think <laughs> about that. Why do these people want to be in power? I think very few of them have good intentions and, and actually think they're going to improve things. And I think even the ones that start off maybe a little more virtuous end up, <laughs> you know, that system. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah. So yeah, like uh, I like to tell people that uh, power is is the most corrupt and the most the most addictive uh, thing even more than cocaine and heroin um, <laughs> and so right. if you really believe that somebody is going to going to take the reins of the most powerful military in the world and, and the most powerful nuclear superpower in the world and use it for peace like how is that how is that possible <laughs> like, just I'm going to I'm going to use the ring for good right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this time, hope and change, it'll be different. And, you know, people said Obama wouldn't be a warmongering president, yet there's been more drone strikes under him than there were under Bush. So I keep telling people, you see the pattern here? Right. There's a pattern. And imagine what the world would be like without all of this. And it's hard for people. I understand it because I was one of those people at one point. I never was really fully statist. I always thought, you know, let's leave people alone and let them do what they want as long as they're not hurting people. Um but the whole, you know, we could do this without government entirely, you know, that I understand for people. They've been indoctrinated and raised in that system and that model. And it's it's scary and very strange to think about not having that. Like, How would it be? It would just be chaos. Really? I mean, look at your neighbors. Do you think that they would be like come over and rob you and kill you as soon as there's no laws anymore or laws what keep people behaving? Or is it mm -hmm. people actually being kind of moral and good deep down, you know? Yeah. I'd like to think that most people are inherently good. <laughs> Maybe I'm naive. I don't know. No, I, no. I think I think that's the only way to think because if if you really think that most people are evil, then you would never feel safe in any um, area where there's a, a, a significant amount of people, like at a mall. You know, it's like what is protecting you against other people from you know robbing, assaulting, or killing you? Is it the law? Is it like the one police officer that's down sitting in his chair in the security department? Is that, <laughs> is that guy preventing everybody from killing each other? Are you serious? Right. That's, that's what I ask people. Like, do you think, like tomorrow, if the, if the laws were all gone, do you think that everybody would just around killing and pillaging and robbing each other? And you know, some people say yes, they think that. Yeah. <laughs> and I agree. I think that's the sad way to think. Yeah, yeah, and you know, I mean, I mean, just just today and yesterday, I was getting into these kind of conversations with some of the um, the homeschooling mothers that I, I interact with, and uh, one woman, she she grew up in uh, communist Russia, and and so you know, she's like, you don't understand, you know, I grew up in communism, so I know that the laws uh, restrict people, and uh, and I'm like, all right, so <laughs> if if I assume you haven't murdered anybody in your life. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, no. Okay. Now, is the reason that you have not murdered because there's a law against it or because you innately understand that it's immoral? <laughs> right? Like if there was no right. law, would you think it's okay to murder people? Like, of course not, right? And and so this is the common um the, the common association people make with with uh legality and morality. Right. They sure do. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's so unfortunate, you know, that, you know, I have to constantly um, tell people that, no, legality really has no reflection on morality whatsoever. You know, you know, there's like you can count on like a, a, on your one hand, the amount of laws that reflect morality and the rest of the tens of thousands of them are for victimless crimes. Yes, exactly. They are. When you point that out to people, sometimes, you know, they say, well, we need I mean, we need the laws because no crime is victimless. And you kind of have to explain what that means, what, which is fine with me. If someone's willing to listen, then I'll go into that. And you get a lot of resistance. But, you know, I see some people come around over time. I think you have to get, be exposed to it a lot for the new those ideas to sink in. That's how it was for me. And I see it with some of my friends. I see them gradually saying, you know what? I think you're on to something. And I'm like, good, okay. <laughs> One less person who thinks I'm insane. <laughs> so so let, me, let me ask you. So do you um, get into these kinds of conversations with, um, you know, not, not Facebook friends, but like people that you meet on the street or in the store or in the bank or, you know, places like that? 
Not so much. Not usually. I avoid it. Um, I, I work from home, so I'm isolated a lot, yeah. unfortunately. It's good and bad. Uh, if it comes <laughs> up when I'm out, sure. But usually what happens to me is when, when I'm out and I see real life friends who don't think like I do, like uh-huh. at, you know, 4th of July cookouts or whatever, they'll say, you know, you have some crazy ideas and I had to unfollow you on Facebook because I don't want to see you talk, talking about that stuff. Really? And, Anarchy is crazy. Yeah. So I, I'm kind of hesitant to bring it up with people unless they ask me about it, unfortunately. Um, I do talk to my dad about some things. He leans very libertarian. Mm-hmm. Um, there, He still thinks that, you know, the U.S. foreign policy needs to be this strong defensive force. And um, so we kind of avoid those topics. <laughs> we don't really talk much about foreign policy because uh, my dad, he's a Ron Paul fan. He likes mm-hmm. Ron Paul. My mom thinks he's a little crazy. <laughs> who, who, your, your father, your father, or Ron Paul? My, my mother thinks. Oh, both. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And me too, of course. And you too, of course. <laughs> no, my dad's like, I like Ron Paul. I like his ideas, except for his foreign policy ideas. And I said, See, I agree with Ron Paul about pretty much everything, but the foreign policy is the big thing for me. You know, if we right. would just butt out, mind our own business, maybe things would be more peaceful. But that's not a popular opinion. <laughs> Yeah. Especially around here in the DC area, it's not so right um, around here. Yeah, I, I was uh, this week. We we went to uh, this pier, and there was a memorial for uh, World War Two, a World War Two memorial. And uh, my kids, you know, it was like it had like a little fence, and there was like rocks and and flowers. And we were with a bunch of other homeschoolers, and they were, you know, the kids were just playing on the rocks, just jumping on the rocks and having fun, right, having a great time. And then this older gentleman came up to us and said. Um, like pretty seriously he's like are those your kids and they say yeah and he's like you know that that's a that's a war memorial you know and, and he's like they shouldn't be playing there <laughs> oh <laughs> and you know i don't know if he was a veteran he looked you know possibly could have been yeah. um but um you know I, I read i read the uh the plaque on it and it said um you know this is in memory of all those people that um you know gave the ultimate sacrifice in defense of their country right mm. and and i and i was i was talking to the other homeschooling parents there and i said focus on that phrase in defense of their country in defense going over an ocean in defense what <laughs> who, very good point. <laughs> is that called defense are you serious it's like it's like um when the united states in like the 19th century was um systematically murdering the native americans and then let's say you know some european countries you know came up and say you know what this is uh this we can't stand for this let's invade the u.s and protect those native americans like <laughs> 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 right <clears throat> I, I mean I, I mean you know it's it's like people tend to think that uh you know like like good and bad in like these wars you know i guess that's what the way they teach it in school like the good and bad the allies and the axis of axis of evil and the allies and you know Right. Yeah. Whereas, whereas, <laughs> whereas, the way I look at it, like this um, insane sociopath against this insane sociopath, <laughs> with their obedient order followers sending them to do battle. <sighs> that's how I see it too. And and now I'll say bankers' wars and things like that, and people will think you know think that's crazy too. And then I I say, well, <laughs> I, I wrote a really long article. Um, I don't know, maybe like a year and a half ago, about that, and it's on my Liberty Me page. And it's about who profits from war. Mm. And it's called blood money. You know, these are the companies and people who profit from war. Mm. And I already knew that that war was a racket before then. Mm. But writing that article really even opened my eyes more. You know, that all these major defense contractors, all the money that they and their CEOs make, you know, from from killing people overseas, innocent people. And so that's a that's a big I mean, being anti-war has been something I've always been that way. Mm. But the more I learn about it, the more I think, wow, people really need to know this. And a lot of people don't want to hear it. Mm. You know, because, you know, 9-11 and Mm. it's so much more complicated than that. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So so what what I try to um, actually. So so I was talking to my, my friends, the homeschooling friends and. And um, and I was asking them. This kind of gives me an insight to how they think. I asked them, "What do you think is the worst thing about the world? Like, if you could, if you could get rid of one or two things that you're, that's your top priority, what do you think those are?" 
and uh, and one of my friends she said um, war and mm. uh, fear, right? Um, mm. Which I think um, both are directly linked to statism. <laughs> oh, <laughs> State, sure, statism, yeah. Right? Being a foundation in fear and war being only ne- only possible through between nation states. It's really sad, isn't it? I, it's it's sad to see people think that way that all these these things are necessary because you know we're supposed to be afraid of whoever the boogeyman of the the year is you know that the government tells us that we need to be afraid of so if it's not Al Qaeda it's ISIS or yeah. ISIL or whatever they're calling them now right. and there's always something that we're and it's the refugees these poor people who are trying to leave their war torn countries we're mm. supposed to be afraid of them too now and it's sad I you know I don't think anyone should live their life in fear especially yeah. of things like that that are because yeah, there's so much more to the story yeah yeah and 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 then and then to to kind of um get you know get an understanding of if they understand where i'm coming from because you know like my friends know that i'm an anarchist and i also i asked my wife this too i'm like now what do you think is my top priority of something that i want to do away with in the world what do you think <laughs> <laughs> and my wife said um government no (laughs) no and then my friend the homeschooler she said laws no (laughs) no why because those things the problem is not in washington dc right the problem is not the military the problem is not the police the problem is not these laws those are the symptoms of the problem right what is why are they there that's the important part because if you if you want to um, create a society, let's say you know you're living in like the 15th century, where you know Christianity is is um, you know all throughout everywhere, and you want to like um, teach people about atheism or about how how you know God is illegitimate or something like that, you don't just murder all the priests and the pope and the bishops, right? Yeah. That doesn't create atheism because they don't philosophically understand atheism. Right. In the same right. sense, you can flip a switch and get rid of all all the politicians, all the bureaucrats, the senators, the congressmen and the police officers in the military. And that doesn't mean that statism is gone. It just means that the physical aspect of them is gone. But the only reason that they're there is because the people have clamored for their existence. <laughs> that is so true. And that's so well said. I really like the way you explain that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Very well said. It's exactly what it is. Yeah. It's, they're the, the symptoms of the, the much bigger problem, the root. And so, and so what is, you know, the, the thing in my mind that I think is most necessary, the priority of, to get rid of is the belief in authority and the initiation of force. You know, those two things, right? Because the belief in authority, what is that, what does that produce? That means that there are certain people that have an exemption to the laws of morality that we're all subject to, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> and and if you don't have that, like if, if, if people don't believe that there are people that have exemptions, then it doesn't matter how insane a sociopath can be. Nobody's ever going to believe that they're a legitimate ruler and nobody would ever obey their whims. That's right. That's true. And that's, you know, that's a reason that I've always allowed my children to question me as long as they do it politely, because I expect, you know, everybody to be polite and civil. Nice. But I've always allowed them to do that um, because my mom was more of she still kind of is more of that. Do what I say because I said so. <laughs> and that never worked. That didn't work well with me. I'd say, well, why? Why? Because I think that if you understand why you're being told to do something or not to do something, mm. it, it's going to make more sense. and You're going to be more likely to, you know, to follow the um, directions, whatever you want to call them. <laughs> but uh, my dad allowed me to ask and he would sit me down and tell me, you know, this is why I'm upset with you. And this is what I expected you to do. You know, why did you make this decision? Why did you, you know, not turn in your homework or whatever it was? So I, I liked that approach because he really helped me understand, you know, what he, he expected from me, but not really because he was the authority or the boss, but because this is going to help me ultimately, mm-hmm. you know, achieve mm-hmm. what I want in life. So with my kids, I've never, I've never just said, you know, because I say so, because I don't want them to just blindly follow authority. I want them to ask. I want them to say, well, why do you want me to do this? Why can't I? Why can't I do it this way? And, you know, with my kids, I'd like to think, you know, I'm biased. I know that they're logical thinkers and that they think things through and they're independent thinkers. And, you know, sometimes it ends up being 
sometimes it bites me a little because <laughs> <laughs> because it backfires on me a little because <laughs> my son will outwit me uh-huh. often. <laughs> It's, you know, you'll see as your kids get older when they're smarter than you are. It's it's not always good for you. (laughs) (laughs) I hope he doesn't hear me now because he doesn't need to know that I think this. But, you know, I may say, well, no, I don't want you to do it like this because for this reason. Uh And he'll say, well, that doesn't really make sense. How that's how is that going to work? And I'm like, okay, fine. (laughs) You win. (laughs) But it's to me that's good. I, I can admit when I'm wrong and when you know my kids are right, and and that's how I think you learn. And that's how you're not going to be blindly obedient to whoever you think is the authority. <laughs> that's that's so awesome of a way to parent, and that's exactly how I'm trying to parent right now. Is like you said, like your father, um, you know, sits down, sit, sits you down, and explains things to you. And uh, and that's what I try to do with my kids, you know, um, and it's so hard. I think that's the difficult part. That's a difficult way to parent. That's not the easy way, you know. That's right. I agree. It is. It's, it can be challenging. <laughs> oh, it's hard work um, and uh, and it's very rewarding. And you know what? I actually look forward. Um, I mean, I know I'm always learning with my kids now, but I look forward to when my kids teach me new things. Like I look forward to them being smarter than me because, um, you know, it kind of reminds me of that um, – that that meme of uh, you know you see a floppy disk and then you see a little did you see you, you saw that meme, right I think so and it, yeah. and it says we should teach our kids to be stronger than us right definitely yeah in <laughs> fact I saw one that was um a, about spanking a couple of days ago and it was outstanding I don't know who the guy was in the picture but he said that you know people will commonly say well I spanked my, my I was spanked and I turned out fine when, you know, anti-spanking people like me will say, you know, you shouldn't hit your kids. It's not the way to do it. And uh, the, in this quote, the guy says, you know, don't we want, okay, maybe some of us were spanked and we turned out fine, whatever that means, but don't we want our kids to be better mm-hmm. than we are? Don't mm-hmm. we want their world to be better? And maybe that starts at home with, you know, nonviolent, peaceful parenting. So I really, I liked the way that he put it. It, you know, we want them. So what if we turned out fine? And I, I'd question that. I think a lot of people didn't turn out fine. They don't really know that. Uh, but but I, I like that way of thinking. It's we want better for them. So I look at it the same way. I learn from my kids all the time. Mm. You know, like, and I'm like, how did you know that? I, <laughs> you know, this world with the internet, they have information at their fingertips. They can learn whatever they right. whatever they want to learn about. And my son will just come out and tell me about things I've never even heard of before. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, that's neat. <laughs> like he watches cooking shows and all kinds of stuff. And cool. have you ever heard of this recipe, this thing? And I'm like, no. <laughs> Do you want me to go shopping by the? Because I don't really like to cook. So I'm like. Oh really? Are you go shopping and buy the ingredients? So you could cook it for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh, I see. Try, trying to raise the chef for your your personal chef. <laughs> yeah, I have an agenda. I get it. <laughs> <Nice>. <clears throat> yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's that, that's that's really awesome. Um, yeah, I really, I really enjoy parenting. You know, there's a lot of a lot of struggle and a lot of difficulties with it, but um, like any, like you know, all throughout my life, I've always embraced um, a challenge. You know that's that's just how I am. I like being challenged, and I, I never I never would prefer the easy way. Um, I think because it's not rewarding. You know, <laughs> you know. True. When, yeah. When, when, when things are difficult, you know, you're you're um, you have to step out of your comfort zone and and learn new skills, right? And so that's when you appreciate things too more. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, so yeah, so definitely, I, I I really have this approach to my kids, and 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 not not all the homeschoolers that I meet, you know, agree with even uh, with me about this, but you know how I I strive to talk to my kids as an equal, you know, as a, not an authority figure, as as a, you know one on one, and and just because I'm bigger, older, and stronger does not mean that um, I I should assert that authority because that is to me the cowardly and the wretched way to parent. Right. I agree. Be- because mm-hmm. there is there is no virtue in in asserting authority over somebody that's like first of all, they're not only they're smaller and weaker than you and have less experience, but they can't leave you. Right? They right. they're dependent on you for like, I don't know, the first fifteen years of their life. Um and so you're gonna take advantage of that and, you know, impose all these rules that, you know, you think they should follow. Um and so you know, as much as possible, I try to nullify my authority as much as possible. And uh, my mother-in-law, she um, she doesn't like it. You know, my mother-in-law, <laughs> she grew up in communist Romania, oh, right? Wow. So you yeah. can imagine 
the level of authoritarianism that she grew up in. And, you know, she, she, she tells, tells us that uh, she's like, you know how in this country you guys have daycare where you drop your kids off and you pick them up at the end of the day? Well, in Romania, when I grew up, we had weak care. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. So they were gone that? all week? All and then week. Got... All week. I mean. Oh, that's so sad. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's like the level, like, like, like you know, Stefan Mali talks about how you know, when you drop your kid off in daycare and they're, you know, just a child, like three years old, maybe, or, or two, it, the, the emotions that they experience is similar to abandonment, right? Just, it really is. You know? Yeah, I was a preschool teacher for a couple of years. And most of the time I worked with two year olds. And a lot of the kids that their first experience with being away from home was when they were two. That's about right. when their parents, you know, and the one the working, the parent who had stayed home went back to work, or they'd stayed with a grandparent until mm -hmm. then. And for a lot of them, it was really traumatic. And it was really hard to see there were always at least a couple every new school year mm -hmm. that really had serious separation anxiety, mm -hmm. that really had a hard time. And we did our best to ease the transition. And, and you know give them love and, and help them feel comfortable but some of them you could see that it just really I, I believe you know that all children's needs are different and for some of those kids I thought this, this child shouldn't be here they should be with a family member they should be at home with a parent and it was somebody who um, you could just you see how traumatic it was for them it was sad so yeah I, I, I agree kids uh, let's, they should ideally be with a parent yeah, or a yeah. family member at least. Yeah. And, um, and so this, this one homeschooling mother I was talking to, um, she let me know recently that, uh, she's going to put her, her kids, they're like, um, six now. And when they turn seven, she's going to put them in public school. Right. And I'm like, mm. why, why are you going to do that? You know? And yeah. her reasoning is because they need to be exposed to the bad elements in society. And that <laughs> and that will inoculate them against those elements. It will harden them, make them tough. And if you you know keep them away from that, um, you know. And also, some people say they have to be exposed to reality, as if you know going to a, a, a public institution where you you know got to sit down and shut up. That's reality. Like I don't I don't get that. Right. <laughs> it, it, yeah, I think it's I, you know. I, I guess a lot of life is like that. I mean, you, you go to school and you listen to these authorities and you sit in the classroom and you do what you're told and then you get a job and it's similar. You know, mm -hmm. you're answering to someone else and you're not really allowed to think for yourself, I mm -hmm. guess, depending on what kind of job you have. But yeah, how sad that, that people think that that's how that's I can't I don't even know what to say about that. Yeah. So what I told her was um you know, the, a great quote that, that summarizes this is, um, I forget who said it, but um, um, rather than um, prepare your children to live in a cold and dark world, why not um, raise your children in such a way that the world will be less cold and dark? <laughs> that I like that way of thinking. Yeah. Why not Let's help them be part of the change? I mean, make things better. You know, it's it's like... It's like, um, you know, it's like people saying, you know, if, if we had chain slavery and they're like, well, that's just the way things are. You know, you got to got to prepare them for reality, for the real world. You know, there's no need, you know, following your your petty moral ideals. Who cares about? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. You know? Um, yeah. Well, you know, like they say, insanity is doing the same things over and over and expecting different results. I mean, yeah. it, having that kind of mentality and thinking that your child needs to get used to the world because it's cold and dark and evil, then, yeah, how are things ever going to get better? I, I want my kids to be part of the, the change, you know, for the things to get better. Yeah, and, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, mm. so please, can you go into a little bit of your background in nutrition and, and how that's affected you as a, as a volunteerist? Yeah, sure. Um, so I've been interested in health since I was a teenager, maybe even before that. Um, my parents weren't necessarily health nuts, but they, you know, kind of educated me. Like we didn't have junk food or anything. And I, I read magazines about it and it's, I never really was that into reading fiction. Even when I was a lot younger, I always wanted to read about health and nutrition and food. And, mm -hmm. and so then, um, I wanted to go to medical school that was my plan when I was coming out of high school. But I never really, and this is another reason I like homeschooling and unschooling. I never really liked the daily school structure. It didn't really work well for me. 
Um, so I went to college right out of high school. Plan was to go to medical school, but I didn't really do. I didn't really like the just the whole structure and, and the track and not having much freedom, um, and and sitting in class with all those people all day just wasn't my thing. And my mom said, you know, I don't, I don't think you should go to medical school. I think you should <laughs> work for the government because that's what my dad did for his whole career. You'll have stability. You'll have great benefits. You'll get a great salary. And I said, no, I can't, I can't be a secretary and sit behind a desk or mm. what, do paperwork all day. It's not mm. my thing. And so I gave up the medical school idea. And then I had my daughter and I studied marketing for a while and came pretty close to getting a degree in that and then realized this is not me. This is not what makes me happy. This is not what I want to do. It's too late in life to go to medical school. So the next best thing would be nutrition. I can help people that way. Mm -hmm. Um, so I went back to school and got a bachelor of science in health sciences with a concentration in nutrition. And then I did almost all of a master's in nutrition and, and then got bored with that and said, um, as you can see, I don't really like structure that much. <laughs> I said, you know what? I can learn more about this on my own. You're some kind so of rebel or something? that's what I did. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> that's what I, I just don't do things the normal way ever. You just, just you know. got to be difficult, you know? Yeah, my parents were like, where did you come from? <laughs> what did we do wrong? And I'm like, well, don't look at it like that. It's gotta, not wrong. It's just different. Just <laughs> I just, just it's different. break all the rules. And <laughs> yeah, I just think, think this is a better way to do it. This works better for me. And I I can't really fight who I am. So I went back and I, I got that degree. And then I worked at a YMCA as a personal trainer and nutrition consultant. So I helped people, you know, figure out how to eat healthier and also how to lose weight. That was a big part of it. And then I became a hypnotherapist too, because I saw benefit, you know, to that, helping people change the way they think in order to lose weight and eat more healthfully. Because largely that's mental. Well, most of it's in your head. So I did that for a while. And then um, I worked for a big weight loss corporation for a couple of years and did weight loss counseling there. And now I just do my own thing. I write about nutrition and health and I'm starting a weight loss consulting business because that's what I really like to do. I like to help people. We have, you know, people, I don't like to say epidemic, but we do have an epidemic of type 2 diabetes and obesity and, and obesity-related health problems now. And a lot of people honestly are confused by all the information that's out there. And, you know, the government has not been a big help in that. Mm. <laughs> and I won't get off on a tangent about that <laughs> unless you want me to. Right. But a lot of the yeah, information they put out about nutrition is very outdated. It's based on flawed studies. So people for the longest time, for example, thought that dietary fat made you fat. Mm. And we need to eat more carbs. Mm. And then that's when all these low-fat, non-fat food products came out. And everybody has more diabetes now. People are more overweight than ever. So my goal is to help people. It, and that's why it's my website's called Nutritional Anarchy. It's We're not doing <laughs> – we're, we're breaking free of the big food and, and the government regulations and thinking for ourselves and seeking out information and taking – responsibility for our own health mm -hmm. and i'm help, trying to help people do that Thanks. awesome um <laughs> yeah that that um yeah i took a similar path uh well a little bit different but um yeah i was interested in in um holistic nutrition and um and i studied chinese medicine acupuncture herbs and uh, and uh nutrition and you know most of the stuff i learned though outside of school you know i uh, read a right. lot and um <laughs> and then I, I read this book called um cure tooth decay uh, Rami Nagel, you familiar with that? Um, I don't know. Remineralize your teeth with good nutrition. Rami Nagel, really awesome book, uh, and that really taught me uh, the benefits of uh, raw dairy, of um, of uh, fermented foods, of um, bone marrow soup, of um, organ meats. You know those th these kinds of things that very few people consume. Um, right. Most people are like, uh, you know, eh, organ, <laughs> you know, <laughs> don't want to go near that kind of stuff. Do uh, you, you have your kidneys, your liver? No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, no not many people are into that. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's, it's it's really, really fascinating. And talking about the food pyramid. Um, yeah, like uh, it reminds me, there was a um, a podcast uh, done by uh, Prof. CJ his dangerous history podcast you familiar oh yeah i yeah. love that podcast yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he he did a podcast i don't know if you heard this one on gr the grains and the state 
No, but I, I want to hear that one. Oh, I'm going to find it. Definitely hear that. <laughs> and, and it basically, he discusses um, how in, you know, when, when, hu- when humanity was more as a hunter gatherer tribes and groups, um, you know, their diet was mainly like meat, berries, um, you know, things like that, that they would find. Um, and then as they became more um, settled, like, like, you know, like even the words that we use, we say civilized. Civilized means that they, that they settled down, developed agriculture. Mm-hmm. And then, and then of course, since w- once you're, once a, a society is settled down, you know, from the perspective of, um, of a ruler and a, and a, and a central authority, it's easier to monitor and control a civilization when they have settled down, right? Because right. And, and the other thing about grains is kind of interesting, like rice and wheat and um, corn or, or soy. You know, these basic things is that you know it, it promotes. Well, first of all, it promotes monoculture. But the other thing is, um, from the perspective of the state, in order to tax um, a portion of that bounty, the harvest, mm-hmm. it's easier to do so if you have them subsistent on grains. Number one, because the um the, the harvest is like all at the same time so right. you know tax man can come gather his gather his bounty and then leave um and also the farmer is basically like um restricted like he can't move you know you have your farm and that's it it's then you know rather a hunter gatherer how are you gonna how are you gonna control and tax a hunter gatherer society they're, <laughs> that's they're always very, moving. yeah that's true isn't that awesome <laughs> and then and so he talked about it from that perspective and then he talked about it from the perspective of health in the sense that, and, and he's not a nutritionist by any means, you know, he focuses on history, but in, and he prefaced that with, I'm not a nutritionist, so don't, <laughs> don't attack me for this. But it seems to me, is what he's saying, that, um, you know, on, on a diet that we would kind of consider, I guess, paleo. In That's what sense, I was thinking, paleo, right? yeah. <laughs> um, that they were, you know, leaner, robust, stronger individuals. And then once they settled down, they became more uh you know, like like obese and more you know have have different diseases associated with grains and and then it made me think of the cure tooth decay book because one of the primary uh things that he stresses about is grains and how horrible they are especially especially whole grains like oh i'm i agree yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and, and and when you look at the usda food pyramid um not only is carbs uh, at the bottom, but specifically grains, specifically whole grains, right? Oh, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> they used to tell us to eat six to 11 servings, I think it was, right. of grain right. per day. And yeah, that has to do with all the agriculture subsidies, right. you know, corn. And, and then, of course, we've got corn syrup, which has replaced sugar, real sugar in, in a lot of foods, mm-hmm. if you want to call them foods, food products. Right. Yeah, all the processed food. You know, I, I just read a study uh, a couple of weeks ago that said, Sixty percent of the typical American diet is highly ultra processed food, mm. and that means food with trans fat, foods with corn mm. um, products, grain. But yeah, I I am a strong believer that the grain is not the best thing mm. for humans. I I really and, and you know then they shifted from well you know let's less white bread. And let's go to whole grain. And I thought, no, that's really not any better. Mm. <laughs> Maybe it has a little more fiber, but that's not where you should be getting your fiber from. You should mm. be getting it from fruits and vegetables and nuts right, and right. seeds. Right. Yeah. So you probably know who Weston Price is. Then. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, what yeah. The, that's what the Cure Tooth Decay uh, data oh, that he used okay. is, based, is based on that. Yeah. Neat. Yeah. I'm a fan, definitely, of them. They've been saying for probably decades. Yeah. That people should be eating whole fat dairy products, yeah, yeah. you know, and not being afraid of eggs, you know, because eggs were demonized for a long time too. Mm. You know, eggs are bad for you because cholesterol, e- eggs do have cholesterol in them, but it doesn't impact blood cholesterol. Mm. So, and, and late, lately there have been more studies coming out saying that. And there are those of us who've been saying this for 20 years. Mm. No, it's fine to eat fat, eat real butter. Don't eat that fake margarine stuff. Right, right. <laughs> it's not real food. Eat real food. So, yeah, I'm definitely all about the real food and the you know, the grains not not so good. Yeah, yeah, and it and it's really it really it was amazing. Like I understood why grains um, are unhealthy from the nutrition aspect, but then when I saw that and I heard the podcast about grains and then. How with the relationship is to the state? And I'm like, whoa! <laughs> they, yeah, they do everything so backwards. <laughs> do they crap. do? And it's 
all about money and it's not at all about what's best for all of us. You know, and now we're paying for it. We have all these health issues now, largely because we were following those guidelines. Yeah, and and the other thing that he mentioned, which was kind of interesting, is as as a um, you know a, a settled population grows, um, the easiest way to feed a growing population is through grains, right? Um, but the problem is. You know, it's not a way to to feed people like the healthiest possible way to get the best possible nutrients. It just gets them fed. Whereas right. the people who you know, if you look examine the diets of the the rulers, you know, most of the time they're not <laughs> they're not having grains, right? No, they're not. They're eating all the good stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it, yeah. Really, it really put it put it into perspective that kind of stuff. Um, and and like like talking about subsidies. Um, like, like, you know, I, I think about, you know, what, how would food look like today if there were no subsidies? Like, if, if they were done away with, like, I don't know, I think they started, like, when in the, like, after, around, um, uh, you know, with FDR's New Deal, I think that's that when they started. I think so. Right. And so I, I imagine these, this is my, like, my little thought experiments. Like, what would, what would um, you know, our food look like completely devoid of of state involvement you know how would it have progressed i have no idea what it would have looked like probably a lot better than <laughs> yeah i mean of course yeah. everything the state touches is kind of of course backwards. definitely <laughs> but it's like it's like and i'm beginning to realize like you know like frederick bastiat's argument um of the false dichotomy like if we object to to uh government school we don't object that doesn't mean we're against education right if we object to um you know, public management of roads doesn't mean we hate roads. If we <laughs> right. so, if we object to to um, state involvement in in um, agriculture, that doesn't mean we hate food. <laughs> <laughs> we want everybody to starve and have no roads and no education. <laughs> right, 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 and and so it, it's really amazing how you're like you said anything that the state touches or gets involved with just immediately gets perverted. And uh. <laughs> I jokingly tell people, whatever the government's telling you to eat, don't eat it. Eat the opposite. <laughs> exactly. And of course, I don't com- really mean that literally, but it almost seems like that. I've watched over all these years that I've been studying nutrition. You know, they'll come out with these guidelines, and I'm like, no, <laughs> don't right. tell people to do that. This is terrible. Right. You know, and, and like I said, now we have type two diabetes. And we're seeing. Type 2 diabetes in kids now. That's Ooh. unheard of. That oh. didn't happen years ago. Right, right, right. That's you know, adult onset. That's not supposed to happen in little kids. Right. So, and, and sugar, of course, you know, big sugar, as I call it, yeah. that industry gets, you know, they have a lot of influence over policy. They, they give politicians a lot of money to say, you know, this, oh, sugar's not so bad for you in moderation. It's fine. Sugar's pretty bad for you. Mm -hmm. It's a huge problem. It's a huge health problem. And, you know, anybody who dares to speak up, I mean, there was a scientist who tried to speak up about that in the 50s. Mm -hmm. He said, I suspect that sugar's the reason that, you know, people are developing type 2 diabetes and obesity. And this was back before those things were epidemic like they are now. Mm -hmm. And he was shunned and he got, you know, uninvited to conferences and he ended up just retiring and writing a book about sugar and hoped that people would read it. And all these years later, you know, now they're saying, oh, this guy was right all along, all those years ago. Just think about if we'd listened. What was his name? Do Do you know? His name was John Yudkin, a British scientist, and his book is was called, oh, what is it? It's a, oh, I have to get the name for you. I can't remember yeah. the name of it. But Dr. Robert Lustig is one of the, he's a pediatric endocrinologist. And thanks to him, the book is now back in publication. Mm. He wrote a forward to it and got it back in circulation because it kind of, you know, become obscure and unheard of. But he's, he's a big, he speaks out about sugar and how we're eating way too much of it and how a lot of that is because of government policy. You know, mm-hmm. sugar is in everything, all these processed foods loaded with it. And I tell people, if you're going to do one thing to, to try to improve your health, and especially for people who want to lose weight, cut out soda and sugar out of your diet mm-hmm. as much as you can. And I don't mean sugar from fruit. That's fine. I mean all the added sugar that's mm. in things. Like even just I like Greek yogurt. Even in Greek yogurt, I can look at that. A container of, you know, strawberry Greek yogurt, 
19 grams of sugar or whatever it's got. Mm -hmm. So it's the one tip that I give people. Watch out for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's really amazing. And and I'll, I'll say one thing about, um, and I, I don't think this is this is related to uh, the state at all. Um, but um, you know, you know, you say like how people are dying of cancer and diabetes now. Um, you know, let's say a century ago, you know, what were the old people dying of at that time? Um, it was very different, right? And mm -hmm. and for me, the reason for that was. Um, basically because the, the technology was not there to um, <clears throat> improve sanitation and sewage and, um, you know, cleanliness in terms of food and water distribution, right. things like that. Um, and and so, you know, I, I, and I can see, you know, state is, you see, this is why we need the government. You see, we would be back in the beginning oh, of the 20th yeah. century. <laughs> if, if, it, if you try to do away with government you you anarchist <laughs> um but but uh but yeah so so in one sense um um like like people are dying from diseases of old age rather than like in their 40s which is nice <laughs> yeah um, yeah so in a sense we are um we are much more um you know how do you say we live in luxury basically right as compared to our ancestors and, and i think uh i think that i like to point that out to people a lot when when people you know talk about how you know how cruel and evil the world is and i mean and, and they're they're right there is a lot of evil things that are going on but but it's like would you like at what point in history would you want to live like would you want to live <laughs> now or in 1900 or in 1800 like where would you <laughs> Good point. Yeah, I mean, I can see benefits of living way back then before all of this. I don't know. I like the technology and then I don't. There's, <laughs> I want to be able to pick and choose. I mean, you know, and, and to get back to the state, them, um, they, they send out these guidelines every five years, these nutrition guidelines, and they're not based on science. And, mm -hmm. you know, researchers at Harvard and, and schools like that are saying, wait a minute, no, you know, you, you guys should have told people to eat, you know, under 10 grams of sugar a day or whatever the guidelines mm -hmm. should have been. Mm -hmm. um, so they were very vague about it, of course, because they get money from that. Mm -hmm. But, um, and I just wanted to add that point in about the state to tie that in. But yeah, I mean, all the, the technology we have, I mean, if we didn't have the internet, we all wouldn't know each other. We wouldn't be able to network with people. We wouldn't be able to learn the things that we learn. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so overall, I guess I'd say I'd want to live in current times, I think. But nutritionally and in some other ways, I don't know. <laughs> back when there was a lot less taxation and yeah, yeah, yeah. they were doing some things right back then. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, you know, the state was growing, but it was it was not nearly where it was today. But um, but you know, another yeah. another thought experiment I like to tell people is that um, this is kind of also tying in with the monetary system. Is if you know if you could have a million dollars now or a million dollars in nineteen hundred, um, which one would you have? Of course, back <laughs> in nineteen hundred. <laughs> what, what, why? I mean, well, I mean it would go a lot, lot farther, right? <laughs> yes, you're right. So, yeah. so because of uh, the Federal Reserve, primarily, um, the purchasing power of a million dollars would be much more at that time. Now, right. now, now, you have to take another thing into consideration: is that um, what can it, what things can you buy in 1900 with a million dollars, and what things can you buy today, right? Now, it's true, right? A million dollars is worth a lot less in terms of purchasing power, but then again. You know, because of all of this innovation and technological advancement, we have so much, so much available convenience, right? Like basic stuff, air conditioning, um, cars, uh, <laughs> refrigeration, <True>. refrigeration <laughs> you know, electricity, indoor plumbing, like... So, so I do like electricity and air conditioning. <laughs> yeah. So, so this is this is the, this is the this is the question to to ask is is um you know at, it, in one sense it is about inflation right and how much mm -hmm. is being destroyed by the central bank but in another sense like you know we live in incredible luxury in the sense that you know so much wealth has been created so that nearly eight billion people are can live right and at that time one billion people were struggling. True. Yeah. Right? That's Good, interesting perspective. Yeah, <laughs> makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, I, I don't know. I like to challenge people. Like when I talk to people about this, and you know, I'm not just. I like being challenged, so it's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I. I, um, I, think... I knew that was a trick question. <laughs> Like, what am I walking into here? I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make it too easy for you. Is that what you think? You're no, it's of, good. I like a Freedom like Fiends co-host. Come on, I, I got a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> that's good i like to be challenged every day i learn something every day <laughs> yeah i mean i mean this yeah. is actually what uh you know listening to tom woods has helped me to realize like he he brings that up a lot like it's it's really 
you know, it, it's really amazing when people complain, complain, like especially, I guess, the leftists and social justice warriors and, um, you know, the occupiers and Bernie Sanders supporters, you know, 1% are robbing us all and, oh yeah, you know, <laughs> ta- tax the rich to hell and... <laughs> Yeah, I have a problem with that too. Like, well, if it weren't for them, you, there were a lot of things you know we wouldn't have. People, you know, they're they're on their iPhones and their their Macs while they're complaining <laughs> about capitalism. So, yeah, <laughs> like, I mean, hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, who who do you think has produced a lot of the wealth that you currently appreciate? <laughs> you know, it's not it's not your next door neighbor who you know who works in McDonald's or Home Depot. I can tell you that. <laughs> you <know? laughs> Exactly. So yeah. we have to be, I think, a little bit appreciative of of what you know um, enterprising entrepreneurs have done by you know taking incredible risk. Right. That, that, that's another thing that I think people don't realize. Like, you know how how risky it is being an entrepreneur and how much capital you have to put up, and you know, uh, and just how much you you have to put yourself on the line. Um, and, and most of the time go into debt just to start a business, right? Oh, yeah, I've been there. <laughs> yeah, I used to own a cleaning business, believe it or not, a couple of years ago. And um, people would say, oh, it must be nice to be self-employed. And I'm like, you have no idea how hard I work and how, how difficult all of this is. <laughs> it's not a life of luxury. First of all, that's a hard business to do anyway, physically hard. Mm. Um, but also... Just you, you know, investing your own money and and time and blood, sweat, and tears into that, not easy. So yeah, I think people don't quite understand what they're saying when they criticize entrepreneurs. Definitely lots of risk and lots of hard work. People aren't successful overnight, typically. Right, right. Takes I a, years. I have a friend who's a uh, a food truck chef, and uh, you know he's an entrepreneur and he's been doing that for a few years. And yeah, he's worked incredibly hard. Um, and and one thing that he's—I mean, he's also a Stephen Molyneux, Tom Woods listener, so he's he's an anarchist like me. And I hang out with his family a lot. And uh, and one thing he says is that um, he he thinks that the people that would embrace anarchy and volunteerism are the most, or that are most likely to embrace those concepts, are entrepreneurs because they understand how how devastating um, taxation is to their business. You know, and oh, all, yeah. all the regulatory hurdles that they have to go over, and just how how much you know the state interferes with what you're trying to do. It really does, and I'm glad you brought that up because I was thinking about that too. How very difficult it is for people to start businesses because of that. And I wonder, you know, if we didn't have all those regulations and taxation and red tape and hurdles to jump through, you know, how how much more successful people would be? Like, just get out of the way and let people do their thing all for the free market idea and people don't understand what that means either <laughs> they think oh no everybody would just steal from each other no this is all voluntary mm. and people helping each other and providing needs and goods and services to each other um, yeah yeah one thing that, you, go, ahead, go, ahead, go ahead no no go ahead <laughs> no i was just gonna say one thing that i uh, i like is, is larkin rose's concept of um, you know if you want to see anarchy in action you go to a supermarket and you see that all these variety of products, I mean, some of them are not so healthy, I see, you know, of course, but still, all these variety of products are produced not because somebody was forced to produce them, right? But because people, they want to make a living, they want to make money, and they can't force you to buy their products if they're not part of the state. So they have to make, you know, them the most attractive and things like that. And and so, you know, it encourages competition and, and innovation and, and, you know, improve the quality at, at a low price and things like that. Um, so, so yeah, so, so, you know, anarchy in action, I think, um, it's important to realize for people that, that they know, you know, anarchy is, you know, it's chaos, it's disorder, it's violent, you know, you're utopian, crazy idealist. Um, (laughs) you know what, every, most of the things in your life are anarchic, right? Do you choose, you know, did your government choose your job? Did the government choose what time to wake up? Does the government tell you how many kids to have, who to marry, you know? <laughs> yeah, who to spend your spare time with, what to read. You could go on and on. On Friday nights, um, I live on a little boardwalk on a, a little beach. And on Friday nights through the spring and fall, they have a farmer's market. So mm. all these farmers come, local farmers, and sell things. And then people sell crafts and things that they make and all kinds of things, you know, going out there. There's local breweries that give beer samples and wine samples. And that to me, that's a, another example. Like these are all people who are presenting their, their products, you mm. know, and you're going to go f- pick the tomatoes that look the best mm. <laughs> out there. And that's to me is anarchy too, in action. I like seeing that 
like all these people who don't have to do this, but they do. Right, and, right. And, and, and oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> um, no, I was just going to say that, um, again, with entrepreneurs, like, like nobody is telling them you have to start a business, <laughs> right? People who are entrepreneurs and, and, and uh, business owners, self-employed, they say, I want to create value. I want to start a business. I think I can make money providing this service or this product to people. And, uh, and so I think it always comes from a, a, a place of providing value, right? It's like, I think it was, um, one of Einstein's uh, quotes that I like is, um, is, you know, you know, don't worry about making money, just provide value to people. <laughs> oh yeah. I totally agree with that. You see a need and you fill it, you know, you, you notice that, Hmm, this is something that we could all use. Hey, I'm going to make that or I'm going to offer that service. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. But, uh, so I don't want to keep you too long, um, but please, um, before we go, uh, just let people know um, if they want to follow your work, uh, where, how they can do so. Oh, yeah, sure. I have a Facebook page. It's called Nutritional Anarchy. And then that's also the name of my website. And then I also run a website called Jake's Health Solutions. And there's an accompanying Facebook page for that. Um, on Twitter, I'm Lily Dane one <laughs> It's a pseudonym I used to write under. And on Facebook, I'm Lisa Delasho, and feel free to add me if you like. I pretty much accept everyone as friends. I want to network with everyone and and learn from everyone. So you're saying you're not going to call people crazy status for trying, <laughs> for trying to challenge your belief? <laughs> no, sl- not at all. Sling, sling ad hominem attacks and insults. <laughs> as long as people are civil, I'm fine with everybody. It's, it's when they start doing the name calling stuff that I get upset. So. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I, like everybody behave. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's like uh, I think Don't I think Don't make me delete this thread. <laughs> yeah. Have you have you had to do that sometimes? The only time I've done that is when things really escalated and gotten really nasty and I've just said I can't like I can't I don't want that to reflect badly on me. Mm. So there have only been a couple of occasions where I've just said, "You know what? I'm just deleting this entire <laughs> Mm. this post because it's just gotten so out of control but usually what i do is just i'll come in and make a joke or i'll make a comment to try to get people to calm down and be civil i'll say like why can't everybody just be nice <laughs> <laughs> i did that a couple of days ago i said you know it's too much to ask for everybody just to be nice to each other it's fine if you disagree i i expect i know that the way that i see things is different from what most people mm-hmm. believe i expect people to disagree with me. I expect people to get a little upset with me at times. Um, you know, and I expect questions and I expect debate, but I don't, I, I like it to be civil. And when it starts to erupt into, you know, heated arguments, <laughs> then mm-hmm. I get uncomfortable. <laughs> like, everybody just breathe. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Calm yeah. down. You you seem you seem like um, a, a very agreeable person, like like you know easy to laugh and joke around, which is great. And uh, and me, I have a background in stand up comedy, and so that oh, has wow. yeah yeah I've done it for like a year, and so it, I I use the comedy in order to help people to make uh, or help people to be uh, like let down their barriers, break the ice, you know, and have them calm down because. Once you can get somebody to laugh, like actually when I meet a new person, um, one of the, especially if a woman, <laughs> I, I, I speak better <laughs> with women, I have to say, it's, it's, but, but um, when, I, when I meet somebody new, I try to make them laugh. That, that's like my first goal because once I make somebody laugh, they're already like comfortable with me. And then yeah, most of the time, too, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, what, and whenever you say, they're more receptive to it. And, and I, I have a feeling that you're the sim- a similar way. Am I... I try to do that. Yeah. I, I have moments where I get frustrated, you know, but I'm not one to, I don't have a temper. I'm not one to let lash out at people. Right. Um, if, if I get, you know, upset or disappointed in how things are going, I'm more likely to just kind of go off to my quiet space <laughs> 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 and think happy thoughts or whatever. But yeah, I tend to be, I'm pretty friendly. Um, I mean, I am, I am overall an introvert, but I am friendly with people. I talk to everyone everywhere I go and, I like to make people feel comfortable. I do. I like to try to build rapport with people and you know, I'm nice to everyone. Right, right. <laughs> I think I think it's so important to um not only tell people what we're against, you know, you know, but what we're for, what we support, right? We are not just against this law, that regulation, this this president, that politician or or against government. We are for freedom, for peace, for love, 
for compassion, for all these things that I think right. most people will cherish, will appreciate. Um, you know, we don't want the poor to, to starve. We don't want... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what? That's a big thing too. And I'm, I'm sure you've come up against this also. Is people will say, "Oh, you know, libertarian types. You know, you guys don't care about anybody." And I say, <laughs> "No, it's actually the opposite. Yeah. You know, we care so much about people that we don't want them to be forced to, you know, follow these regulations and and get." pulled over for silly things and get arrested for victimless crimes and thrown in a cage. Like we actually care a lot. We want the world to be better for everyone. And, you know, you kind of have to explain that to people sometimes because they, they do think you don't care about the roads yeah. <laughs> and poor people and you don't want people to have health care. And I'm like, no, I, I do want all that. But I, I think this is a better way to make that happen. Mm -hmm. It's less violent and, you know, more peaceful and, we should all not be forced to do all these things. It should be voluntary. And, you know, it takes a little explaining to get people to understand that because I, people will say, oh, you know, you must be a Republican because, you know, you don't, <laughs> you don't want the government to provide health care. And I'm like, oh, no, it's not. <laughs> no, <laughs> let me explain. Right. <laughs> I, I do care a lot. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, this other quote that you reminded me of, which is, um, uh, the amount of energy that it requires um, to produce uh, or, or, or to say BS um, or <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> the amount of energy it required to refute BS is orders of magnitude greater than the amount of energy to produce it. <laughs> See? <laughs> you know? That's true. And, and, and like, like you said, and, and the other thing is when, when, when you have, when you're talking to somebody, um, it's, I think it's important, an, another way to have them calm down is to um, highlight what you both agree upon. It's like you both agree that we care about the poor people. Okay, that's, mm -hmm. that's what we have in common. Now, we have two very different ways to go about that. And how is that possible? Like, uh, we really have to, you know, you have to examine, like, how can we both, you know, if, if I'm saying that the government is a monopoly on violence and you know, a, 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 an institution founded on in intimidation and coercion. And you're saying the government is a nice thing and it just helps people. <laughs> like, it can't be both, right? Right. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Find common ground, right? So, yeah, it's important to examine that a little more. And, and like, uh, you know, hopefully we can, uh, you know, come to a conclusion here because obviously we both have a common, uh, you know, desired result. Right. Yeah. You, and you kind of learn who you already have that common ground with. You know, <laughs> I know that if you're talking to conservatives, there's going to be certain things you're going to agree on and, and certain things you're going to have to approach from a different angle. Mm -hmm. a and same with, you know, obviously with liberals, too. It's like, well, wait, wait a minute. We actually have all these things in common. Yeah. But we just think of, of that should be handled a little bit differently. So right. I, I have, you know, friends who are all over the political spectrum um, that I interact with and. You know, it's interesting. Most of the time people are civil and we can able, we can brainstorm ideas. And, you know, I, I don't have all the answers. Mm -hmm. And I tell them that because they kind of, you know, I'm sure you've come up against this too. Mm -hmm. Well, what about this? How would this work? And right. it's like, exactly. I don't really know, <laughs> you know, but I'm sure we can figure it out because we've created airplanes. We've flown to the moon. <laughs> right, right, right. We, we've done a lot of amazing things, yeah. humans, and yeah. I'm pretty sure we could figure out. Roads. The, re the rest. <laughs> yeah, I think we can. For some reason, roads are this. Like, <laughs> it's those. It's, it's those crazy thing that we just can't. You it, know, it's figure those out. flat. Those. You know, the, the airplanes are fine. The shuttles, the spacecrafts. You know, those are fine. It's the flat places with lines yeah. painted on. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> where we need uh, something to force us to make <laughs> right and i don't know about where you live but where i live the roads are in pretty bad shape so their argument isn't really valid <laughs> like maybe well, if... <laughs> well then, they would, then they would come back with you see that's why we need more funding yeah yeah they probably would <laughs> oh it's a vicious circle, <laughs> yeah. circle. <laughs> um but uh but yeah yeah i just wanted to say that um i think that you know I, I try to have an agreeable demeanor and try to laugh a lot and put the person at ease and make jokes and things like that. And when you do that, um, you know, you, they're much more receptive. And, and it's kind of, uh, um, what is that quote? I think it's Mark Twain um, when he said, if you, want to, uh, if you want to tell people the truth, uh, make them laugh or they'll kill you. 
<laughs> pretty much. <laughs> right? That sums it up, yeah. <laughs> and, and I love that. I love that so much because I use that strategy a lot in what I do. Um, you know, you just got to approach it with laughter. And, and especially those, uh, I don't know if you, you heard some comedians that, that are kind of libertarian leaning, like Doug Stanhope. And, yeah, I love him. Yeah. You know, um, <laughs> of course, and, there's Carlin and too. And Carlin. Um, yeah. And I, I guess Bill Hicks in a sense a little bit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I'll quote Carlin quite a bit. Sometimes I'll put, post clips to his, you know, from his acts where he's talking about voting and how, mm. you know, because people will say, if you don't vote, you don't get to complain. And of course, right. Carlin has a really great rebuttal to that. So I, I use that sometimes. I'm like, well, I think George Carlin said this very well when he said, actually, yeah. the people who don't vote are the ones who have the right to complain because right. we didn't get us in this situation. Yeah, yeah, we're not. So I try. <laughs> we're not using an agency that that relies on coercion and force to try to get our whims met, right? And and the other important thing that to to uh, uh, the principle is, um, yeah, good ideas do not require force. And you know, I think you can apply that to so many things, like vaccinations, like um, you know, like food subsidies, like you know, so many, so many different things, education, this. <laughs> So many things. Yeah, that was one of the issues we had when my son was still going to school was was attendance. So he was in all honors courses. He was doing just fine. He was bored, but he was doing fine. He didn't get in trouble or anything. But he, he missed some school just because, you know, getting up and being at school at 720 in the morning just doesn't – he's not a morning person and neither am I. Mm. And so he was late a few times and they really started to get on me about that. And that's when I started saying, you know what, like overall all this, you're bored – you could be doing so much more on your own. He wanted to learn Russian and he didn't teach it there. Mm. And all these little factors. And I said, you know what? We, we really should just be doing the homeschool thing. And he's like, I'll think about it. <laughs> <laughs> and then he weighed everything and he's like, okay, let's do that. <laughs> nice. I let him decide ultimately. I, I pushed for it a little, you know, encouraged. But he, I, I wanted him to be happy. And I wanted him to be in an environment where he, he would learn best and be happy. Mm. Wow. So that was what he chose and it's been good. But yeah, I, I thought the same thing. I'm like, hmm, they're forcing attendance and <laughs> the kids to learn certain things. And, you know, maybe all this isn't so good after all. Maybe he should be learning more about things he's interested in at his at his pace. Right. So, right. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I agree. Yeah. It's a good idea. You probably don't need to, you know, coerce and force and threaten people to do it. Right, right. Like, you know, vaccinations, like, okay, you know, it's a good mm -hmm. idea. Do you really have to threaten violence of the state on people who don't, you know, wish to participate? Mm, not such a good idea, I don't think. Right, I don't think so. Yeah, educate them about it and let them decide. And, and I know people will say herd immunity and... You know, that's that's a whole other argument that I've had with people um, over and over for, I don't know, 20 years. <laughs> but, uh, you know, ultimately it comes down to the force for me. And that's what I have a problem with. If people want to do it, fine, their decision. But don't try to force those who don't want to mm. for whatever reason because it's their life, their child, their mm. decision. Yeah, yeah. And it calls into question who's... Who really um, makes the decisions or has, let's say, ownership of the child? Is it the parents or is it the state? <laughs> it really feels like the state more and more. I mean, even I don't know about where you live, but even we're here with homeschooling. They want us to check in a couple of times a year. And I'm like, who's the whose child is this? Mm. You know, why do I have to check in with you? Why right, right, right. dare I question right. that? And then I become, you know, a subject of interest. Like we better really check up on her. <laughs> Let's go visit her. <laughs> Where um, does she live? You know, I just don't. And I think, you know, we all comply at somewhat mm -hmm. if we have to, just to avoid that. You mm. don't want your kids getting taken away. And right, right, right. so, yeah, I, I wonder often who owns you and who owns your, your family it's going to be kind of spooky sometimes when you don't agree with the mainstream ideas. Right, right. And and when you say comply, um, you know, basically you're complying out of self-preservation. And then so when you do that, um, then people come around and say, you see, you're a hypocrite, you're an anarchist, and yet you're, you know, you're, you're complying and you're paying your taxes and you're using public roads and you go to libraries. <laughs> Someone told and, me today that I shouldn't use the roads anymore. I was like, oh, and, <laughs> you and, missed the whole point. And, you, <laughs> and you're using Federal Reserve notes, right? It's government money. You're, you're, you're a big <laughs> hypocrite. And, yeah. And so, and so my rebuttal to that is, um, is if if I'm in prison 
and uh, and and they give me food, <laughs> and I eat the food. Um, am I complying, or am I? Do I accept my imprisonment? You know, am I saying? Does that justify my imprisonment? Of course not, right? You know, right. There, there are certain things that you have no choice. You know that you know, um, you know, you're using the the post office, so you know you you uh, <laughs> you like the uh. government. <laughs> Hmm, yeah, I'm pretty sure they have a monopoly on certain things. I don't really. So, have, I don't really yeah, have, not, having, not having a choice is is not the same thing as supporting. <laughs> so. Exactly, I'm no I'm no good to my family if I'm caged. Right. <laughs> so certain things that I I have to do, but you know. Yeah. But uh, awesome conversation. <laughs> I think we can go on for a lot longer. Uh, but Probably both of us. I know you're a freedom fiend, so you're used to going on for a lot longer. <laughs> I'm not. But uh, but anyway, so uh, before we go, can you um, just say uh, like a favorite quote that you have of all time? I like to ask people that question. Oh, oh. <laughs> I'm sure there's so many. Um, let me think. Okay, this is just popping into my head, and it's going to seem very random, but I was talking about it earlier today. Um, you know, people talk about – I was talking to some Bernie Sanders supporters about taxation and health care and his education plans and free college and all of that, and they were talking about minorities needing to be taken care of. And I said, well, the smallest minority is the individual. And I like to remind people of that, you know, that, that there's – group rights aren't legitimate Mm. individual rights are because that's ultimately the smallest minority Mm. so that's one quote that i like yeah yeah definitely um and and how destructive it is to to not only think of you know people as nationalities but to think of people as races or religions or you know ethnicities or you know sexuality or whatever you know all all homosexuals all muslims all mexicans all women all all, all women all black all Mm -hmm. rich and all poor you know and how that's really really a very destructive way to think about things um because you know and that's why i love i love uh you know volunteerism is you know it focuses on the individual you know you can never you can never discount the individual, right? Because the in, without the individual, there is no group. Right. <laughs> there is exactly. No group. Yep. Yep. So, I'll tell people I don't need this because I I want it to get down to that level. Like each person matters. Right. Not just and, and, and then and, and of course you know they're going to pervert that statement and say, well, you're just so selfish. All you just think about is yourself. <laughs> If only they knew. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like amazing. Anything we say, you know, can be perverted into oh, always like malicious, yeah. malicious intent. And it gets to the point where you you know what's coming, right. and you'll kind of like, I'll post something preemptive to try to stop. I'm like, I know what you're gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a Republican, or I'm not a Democrat. I'm just. <laughs> Yeah, I remember. I remember when my my uh, I, I told you know excitedly learned about volunteers. I was telling my my mother, who's a very big uh, um, Bernie Sanders supporter, um, socialist, and uh, she's like she's like, what right wing nut are you listening to? <laughs> <laughs> She's no. like, are you watching Fox News? <laughs> She's like, I'm like, no, I'm I'm off the spectrum, off the spectrum. Yeah. I'm not not even on there yeah. at all. It's way over here. Right, right. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't, 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 don't want to associate with politics. I'm apolitical. That's that's what I say. They're right. like, you talk about it all day long, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> right. So, awesome conversation, uh, Lisa. Thanks Thank a lot. You. I really appreciate it. Um, so, so if anybody wants to help me out, um, you can do so through uh, Bitcoin, PayPal, or Patreon. The links are below. Uh, it's patreon.com slash peaceful anarchism to help me out. You know, a dollar a show is uh, is all I ask. If you like what I do, I uh, you know interview fascinating people like uh, Lisa here. I'd love to do more. <laughs> yes, you are fascinating. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and, uh, right and, back at you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> And I would love to do more. And uh, monetary compensation is always appreciated because we respond to incentives, right? We are capitalists in the end. And, uh, you know, you know, this is this is free, but, you know, our time is not free, right? It always call, it comes at a cost, right? There's always opportunity costs to the time that we devote to something. So, uh, Definitely. so monetary <laughs> compensation is always appreciated and encouraged. Uh, so awesome conversation, Lisa. Thank you very much for coming Thank on. Thank you. No, no problem. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> no problem. So this Fun. is, this is uh, Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and theseasoflibrity.com and theconsciousresistance.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye. <laughs>
Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.